Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So welcome everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Vasilis Gatselis. Uh, Vasilis is a postdoc in Berkeley currently and he will be a faculty at Drexel soon. And Vasilis has done some uh, really interesting work in uh, algorithmic game theory uh, and in particular how to uh, allocate goods to agents in a fair manner. So he'll talk about uh, approximating Nash social welfare which is one uh, measure of fairness. So, over to Vasilis. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so, I'm going to talk about uh, how to approximate the Nash social welfare with indivisible items. So, the goal here will be that we have a set of indivisible items uh, that we want to allocate to a set of participants. And as Nikhil mentioned, the Nash social welfare is a measure of fairness. We're going to try and maximize fairness and some notion of efficiency at the same time. And this is joint work with uh, Richard Cole at NYU. So let me dive right into the specifics of the model. So we want to distribute a collection of items among a set of agents. Uh, and each agent, we assume, has additive valuation. So let me define this right away. So we have a, in this case, let's say we have these five items and we have an agent i. So the fact that agent has added evaluations means that we can represent his preferences using a vector of just five numbers, one for each item. Let's say these are the numbers, 15, 2, 4, 5, and 3. Uh, in this case, this means that if we allocate uh, the first item to the agent, his value for it would be 15. If, on the other hand, we allocated item 2 to the player, his value would be 2. The, the part where additive makes more sense is when you have more than one items, when the player is allocated two items, two and three, let's say, then his value is the sum of these two, which is where additive comes from. And you can imagine if he gets one, two, three, and four, his value is 11. Two, three, four, and five, his value would be 14. You just sum up the corresponding numbers. And the important thing that these numbers tell us is that, for example, in this case, if you had to choose between giving this player this one item or the bundle of items two, three, four, and five, this says the player actually prefers the first item, right? So it tells us in a concise way what the preferences of the player are. Player. And we're going to assume that this is the case throughout uh, the talk, that the valuations are additive. So this is, of course, more interesting when you have more than one agents that are competing for these items, and you're trying to find a way to distribute, essentially, you're distributing value across the players. And we're going to be denoting uh, the set of agents by n and the set of items by m. And the items are indivisible. This means you cannot cut an item in half or in a smaller pieces and uh, give it to more than one player. Uh, and also that for each agent, we're going to be using a variable xij, which is either 0, 1, because of the indivisibility, which is an indicator variable regarding whether agent i will actually get item j or not. OK, so formally, uh, this could be uh, a matching, uh, sorry, uh, an assignment of the items, since I mentioned it. So we're not going to be talking about matching the items to agents. An agent can get more than one items. Uh, and for each agent i, the valuation of the player is going to be denoted like this. Okay? So it's just the sum over all items of xij times vaj, whether the player got the item times his value for that item. Make sense? I'm going really slow, but just to make sure this is the fundamental setting. So the question here is, overall, this is, this is your design set. You can choose over all these possible ways of allocating the items to the agents. The question is, which one do you want? And we're going to be shooting for fairness, making sure the, uh, the allocation of the items is fair, and in some case, in some sense, also efficient. And when people talk about efficiency, uh, in this setting, the first thing that comes to mind is what is uh, called uh, the utilitarian social welfare. That is, I'm going to try to allocate the items in a way that maximizes the sum of the values of the players. So the aggregate happiness, the aggregate value, the sum of the values. Uh, which, if you look at this setting, can you imagine what that would be? 
There are more than one ways to do this, maximize social welfare here, but this is one of them, right? So this maximizes social welfare. You can see that uh, the sum of the values would be maximized in this way. So clearly this is extremely unfair, right? So one player gets nothing, the other player gets everything. So just maximizing this utilitarian social welfare alone can be really unfair as an outcome. So our goal would be to introduce fairness into this. And the standard uh, way that people have been approaching uh, fairness is what is called the egalitarian social welfare. And that is, our goal in this case would be to maximize over all allocations the minimum value across all players. So in, in other words, try to make the least happy person as happy as possible. And you might have seen this, this is a well-studied uh, problem, exactly the same thing I've just, just described, the uh, added evaluations and this objective, uh, and it's called the Santa Claus problem, is one way in which uh, you might have heard of it before, and there's a long line of results. Uh, but in this general setting, it, there's a, still a big gap in terms of uh, the approximability of this problem. But even this objective, can, can you figure out what that would do in this allocation, that same instance as before? if you try to maximize the minimum. All one item. Exactly. So it's extreme in the other sense. It gives all the items to the hard to satisfy agent and the other agent gets just one item. So in some sense, this is ex an extreme notion of fairness that's trying to satisfy maybe a person who's really hard to satisfy and sacrificing efficiency. Our goal here will be to find the balance between the two. And what we're going to be trying to maximize is a Nash social welfare objective, which is the geometric mean of the values. Okay? And before I explain why this is a well-motivated objective, let's see what it would do in that same instance again. And let's start from the max min allocation that we had before. So you, you can verify easily that this is actually not maximizing the geometric mean in the following way. If we get se uh, seven item, uh, item seven and we take it from agent one and give it to agent two, Agent 2 doubles his value, whereas Agent 1 doesn't have, it's, it's still not losing as much. So that would be actually an improving change. So would this one, so would this one, and in fact this is the product maximizing or geometric mean maximizing allocation. So intuitively in this, in this instance you can see how it balances, it tries to distribute value in a, in a, in a balanced way, but let me make it a bit more concrete. Uh, so this... Uh, Objective, the Nash social welfare objective, satisfies some highly desired properties. One of them, which I think is really important, especially in this setting where there's, there's no payments, it's just an allocation, it, it satisfies scale freeness. That means that the outcome does not depend on what scale the VIJ values are reported in. Right? So if I take for every player uh, i, some parameter, some positive value, uh, alpha i, and multiply all the VIJs by the same value, this will not change the outcome in any way, right? And this is very important because usually when there's monetary payments, you can express the values in the sense that uh, this is, the value means how much would you be willing to pay for this item. But once there's no values, this means nothing really. The, the scale might not necessarily be, have any specific meaning. So if I multiply all my values by a, a big constant and that changes this out, the outcome, this is a bit tricky. There's, there's no real reason why that should happen. And it's easy to verify also that if you think about the previous two objectives, the utilitarian and the egalitarian social welfare, they both heavily depend on the scale. In, what, in, one's, uh, in the utilitarian, you would want to scale upwards. In the egalitarian, you would want to scale downwards. Whereas in the product, it doesn't matter. And this is a real information. The real information you're trying to get from the participants is the relative preferences across items. The, the, the scale doesn't matter. So this is the objective that satisfies this and that avoids this interpersonal comparability of individuals' preferences. This means numbers, the scale of one shouldn't be comparable to the other in a particular way. And the second good thing is that it strikes a balance between fairness and efficiency. And you can see it, uh, one way to see it is this, that this is the generalized mean. Uh, and if you take uh, p going to minus infinity, you get max min. If you take p equals one, you get uh, the average, the utilitarian social welfare. And for p equals zero, you actually get the geometric mean. So in some sense, it lies between these two extremes. Uh, it still tries to balance value, but it's not going to do it in, an, uh, in a really unbounded, uh, inefficient way. And another reason why it's 
uh, this is interesting is that the same objective has been discovered by many different communities. It is the objective uh, optimized by the Nash bargaining solution. It is uh, the proportional fairness objective in networking. It's also the competitive equilibrium for equal incomes objective uh, or the Fisher market objective. So in many different communities, economics, uh, networking and, and others, it, this arises naturally. And as I'm going to be mentioning later, maximizing the product is equivalent to maximizing the sum of the logs. Maybe this sounds more intuitive. You've seen it somewhere. Um, okay, so hopefully I've convinced you that this is a, an interesting objective to understand and optimize. So let me formally define our problem. So let X star be the integral allocation maximizing the Nash social welfare. Our goal is going to be to design an algorithm computing an integral allocation X that satisfies this. The geometric mean of the optimal is at most some raw factor of what we get. So in terms of approximation, yes. um, why, what makes more sense? The geometric mean or say the sum of logs? So you're saying, I mean, if you get the geometric mean approximation, a multiplicative one like this, you get an additive also at the same time for some log. So it's a stronger. Makes sense yeah. to get, talk about like multiplicative approximation to sum of logs. So I'm not sure that there would be, I mean, in, yeah, I think in some sense that log transformation is a bit less intuitive, what happens and what, what you should be expecting in this. And, and here, essentially, you know that, for example, if you get every player half the value they should be getting, they, you get a half approximation. So essentially, I think the log kind of messes things up. But I'm not sure what, what the right thing would be. No, I, I don't know why it would be wrong to aim for log. But this, in some sense, is stronger. So the other thing is, uh, like, yeah, if, you want to, if you get zero, yeah. um, will you get zero in both? Like, uh, oh. yeah, log would log zero would be minus infinity. Yeah. So, so, yeah, but you don't want that either way. Here it would be zero. Zero. So. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, at, at some point we started thinking about the sum of the logs because it's you know it's a submodular function. Mm -hmm. So you we were thinking like oh maybe I could do like a greedy like allocation rule, mm -hmm. but it's it's messy. It didn't seem like all the greedy type approaches that we tried didn't seem to make sense, uh, and, and that would only give a multiplicative in it. But maybe maybe it's uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the best known uh, algorithm before our work was uh, growing linearly with a number of items. So what is this NR? Uh, um, Gwen and Rotten. Gwen? Yes, and Rotten. What is N? And Gwen, that's how it's for NG. Oh, Gwen. Oh, okay, I see. N? Uh, Rotten. Oh. Uh, and uh, after our... What was the context in which they constructed it? They just wanted to solve Same problem, yes. Um, and uh, the problem was uh, very recently shown to be APX hard. Uh, after after our our talk at that stock, um, I'm not sure. He's a student at CMU. I'm not sure I remember the name. It's an archive. The paper. Um, okay. So our main result is that uh, we propose an algorithm that achieves a small constant approximation factor, uh, 2.889, uh, which, at least to us, was a bit surprising that you actually can do that. Uh, and yeah, the talk is going to be around how we achieve that approximation, how the, the problems that we had to face. Um, so formally, you can write this. The, the problem that we want to solve is exactly this one, right? We want to maximize the geometric mean subject to the valuations which are additive, uh, and we don't want to over allocate any item, and the xijs are between 0 and 1. And the first observation is if you take a log of the objective, as I mentioned before, you get the problem of maximizing the sum of the logs of the utilities, which is convex, so it's getting better because the pro previous one was horrendous. Uh, and if you uh, relax uh, the integrality, then what you actually get is the Eisenberg-Yale program, which has been well studied, and we can solve this. So the first reaction is great. Let's solve this uh, program and then try to round it and get a, a good approximation algorithm. Unfortunately, this uh, fails uh, miserably because the integrality gap of, uh, 
of, the, of this program is unbounded. And let me give you an example. It doesn't, it's, an, it's an easy example to consider, but uh, just to get a sense of why this, this happens, this is just an observation that uh, if you have uh, these items, M items and, and agents, but every agent has a very, very strong preference. Let's imagine this V being arbitrarily high, a really, really strong preference for the first item. Then in the fractional solution, the players can share the top item. Well, and that you only one item, then you could that. that too, but I just want to, uh, this is kind of, the reason I avoid this instance is because it's kind of, the product would be zero anyway, so sure. Yeah, the integrality gap, in, that instance is kind of easy to solve, but you can imagine even if these other items have some small value, uh, it might be harder to figure out whether you can actually achieve it. But yes, even just having one item would also give you the integrality gap. Uh, so yeah, they can share it and get a high value, share essentially the high value, but in reality only one of them will get it. So it's clear that there's no way you can actually get this uh, to work. So what this shows is that there's no way to prove uh, using this as an upper bound, the fractional uh, objective value as an upper bound, uh, to prove a good approximation. So uh, just to be clear, suppose, maybe that's what you had it. Suppose the uh, values are either like zero, like some values are zero, some are non-zero. Yes. And I want to check whether the answer is zero or not. Mm -hmm. Your algorithm will do it, right? Yes, so we achieve oh, a constant. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, but how, like, yeah, so, but your current programs cannot do it. No, we're not going to use that program. Yes. yes. But that's a, what I want to say, that's a matching, right? You're doing the no, no. no. By part of matching, like I just want to say there's a matching. Of course, I just want to check whether that's oh, yeah. zero or non zero, right? Yeah, yeah that you can solve. Yeah. Uh, so, can you go back to the pre program? Actually, I just want to see the program. So, UIs are just anyway dummy variables, you can remove them, right? Like, yes. Yes. It's just for convenience. Okay. So, okay. So, what are solution is going to revolve around and the intuition will come from is the fact that in fact this this program we're just looking at has a very natural interpretation as a market equilibrium and you don't need to know exactly what I mean by that I'm going to explain how this works uh, you can imagine if you take this instance that uh, each agent is allocated a budget of one one dollar of money that have no value beyond this particular setting the goal is to spend all this all of this money and there are prices for each item. There's a price PJ. I'm not going to at this point tell you yet how we come up with these prices. These are the duals of the program, but let's say we have them. So once I, I give the, these prices and you can imagine the agents arriving one after the other, uh, think of agent one arriving. Uh, what are the preferences? He has a value of 15 for the first item, zero for everything else. Clearly he wants to spend his money in the best way possible, which is spending it all on the, on the first item, right? So he can spend his $1 on this item and he buys a third of that item. Then the second player arrives and you can verify that the value per uh, price ratio is the same for these two items for the player. So he's indifferent between these two. However he spends his money between the two is, is fine. I'm going to intentionally tie break upwards in this case and have him spend his money optimally again, the way he would, to get the best he could get using that, uh, those prices, and buy the second third of that item. And we continue the same way. If the third player arrives, you can verify the maximum bunk per buck items, the ones that have the best value per price ratio, are, the, are one, three, four, and five. Uh, so again, I will tie break upwards and let him buy the remaining third of that item. Conveniently, when the last player arrives, he likes all these items equally, and the sum of these prices are one, so he can buy them all, and that's perfect. So that's market clearing. Mm -hmm. So the very nice thing about this is that what, what we require is that every player is, is spending his money on his, uh, to buy his best bundle given the prices. All the items are fully allocated, and all the players are spending all of their money. Once you have these properties, you know just by showing you this, you know that this allocation maximizes the product. Okay? Uh, so the, the issue, and let, let me make another point now. So before I made the point that the integrality gap of this program is high, now I'm going to less formally try to convince you that apart from, so in, in that sense, the, the program fails to give us a good upper bound because it gives you a high integrality gap. But I'm going to argue uh, here that uh, somehow it also doesn't give you a, right, a good fractional solution to round from. So if you look at this one, you know that 
Since the top player has no other alternative, he really only likes the first item, he will essentially get it. If you want to maximize the product, he should be getting that item. But there's also player two and player three that in this fractional solution, all you know about them is that they're getting a third of that item as well. But if you look at their preferences, they're very different. With, they're absolutely different with respect to their preferences other than that first item. So knowing that they will not be getting that first item, you have no information about how to distinguish how to round one and how to round the other, right? So these two are very different, but in terms of your fractional uh, allocation, they're the same, right? So you can imagine if I make this even more expensive that there will be more and more information lost inside this fractional allocation, okay? And based on this intuition, what we do, so we started from the Eisenberg-Gale program. We moved into the market equilibrium interpretation. What we're going to do now is to tweak the market equilibrium interpretation to get a different equilibrium that reveals more information and helps us get a good upper bound. Right? We're not going to use this. We're going to use a different one. In order to do that, uh, the main trick that we use is we apply a constraint on, the, on how much spending can go into any item. And this is uh, the spending restricted outcome that we uh, aim for the spending restricted equilibrium allows at most one dollar to be spent on any item right so one player's worth of budget is the most that can be spent on any item in this new equilibrium that I'm defining so in this case this fractional solution that we saw before violates this there are three players spending one dollar so there's a total of three dollars going into this item so this is not allowed in this new constraint that we introduced so in order to get uh, an equilibrium that satisfies uh, this additional constraint, we have to keep, you can imagine that if I disallowed player two or player three, if they arrived in the same order, I disallowed them to spend their money on one, then they wouldn't be able to spend the prices, all the other prices are too little. There, there will be too much demand for the other items. So in order to find this, we actually keep increasing the prices and we can discuss how we figure out these new prices later on, but we come up with these new prices and you can verify that these prices satisfy the additional constraint plus uh, most of the ones we had before. In particular, it's th this is a new market equilibrium in the following sense. Player one arrives, still his prefer preferred item is the first one, right? So he spends his money there. That means nobody else can spend on that item anymore because there's one dollar of spending going into it. See, but it's price is ten dollars or in this picture, so what does it? No, so, yeah, so the prices are, can be higher. So in this case, this is not fully allocated, right? So there's a it's price. It's a fractional allocation. Yes, it's still a fractional allocation. So you're buying one-tenth in this case. But the player still prefers one-tenth of item one than anything else. But nobody else can now. Yes, so I'm not, yes. Yes, so this, the rest of it will be unallocated in the fractional solution, but we only use it as a guide. We're not going to. So then the second player arrives. He's equally, again, interested in the first and the second item. So the restriction that nobody spends more than $1 on item one, it's not really restricting the optimization problem for the buyers. Yes. So the, buyers still, the players are still exactly. buying their optimal bundle. Yes, the players are still buying their optimal bundle, and we have to allow them to be able to do that while satisfying the constraint. Exactly. Uh, and you can verify, and this is what I'm verifying now, that in fact, here I can combine their preferences with uh, the additional constraint. So player two arrives, he's indifferent between these two items, and now I will let him buy this one, which means nobody else can spend on item two either now. Third player arrives, he's indifferent between all these items, I'm going to choose, let's say, this way of him spending his money, which means he pays uh, two thirds, gets all of this, and one third, he gets half of this. And the last player arrives, He's interested in all these items, and there's a way again to spend his money. Okay, so to be more precise, the constraint that I want is if the price of the item is higher than one, the spending has to be one, exactly. If the price of the item is less than one, then I want it to be fully allocated. So the spending on it is exactly the, the price. And what I verified with this example again in this new outcome is that every player again buys his favorite bundle of items, spends all of his money, but instead of the items being fully allocated, I have this new constraint now, that the spending cannot be more than one, which means maybe some of them are not fully allocated, okay? So this will be at the center of our result. We use this 
uh, fractional solution, this uh, spending restricted outcome in order to come up with uh, an upper bound and a rounding algorithm. And the intuition, one thing that I want to mention How compared to Excuse me? Like, I'm not now sure that they, these prices exist, right? So up until, like, the answer to why they exist is that we have an algorithm for, for computing it. But uh, I just, uh, few, uh, a few hours ago, I realized there's also a convex program for computing this solution. Uh, and the, these... You just put this restriction that I, like, you won't get collect more than $1 for each. That's, uh, you have to use a different convex Yeah, program. it's a different convex program. But yeah, we didn't know that. Uh, so I'm going to come back to that later on, okay, yeah. how, how to reach these prices. Uh, but what I wanted to uh, notice here is that, remember these players I mentioned, we had no information about why the previous fractional solution was not a good guide for the rounding algorithm. You can see here that by applying this spending constraint, I forced these players to spend on less demanded items. I pushed the demand to lower items. And now you see that player two and player three have revealed much more about their preferences than before. Now I can tell them apart. I can tell that player two wants item two, player three wants item three or four. So as we're going to show, this helps us round and get a good uh, approximation. OK, so the main contributions <clears throat> that we get uh, are the following. First, uh, that the spending restricted outcome, what I just described, is computable in polynomial time. Uh, in order to do this, we actually used uh, some uh, algorithms that were known, uh, combinatorial algorithms that were known for computing the solution of the Eisenberg Gale program by Devanur et al. Uh, but apparently, uh, there are different ways of doing it uh, now. Uh, and the second one is that the spending restricted outcome implies a better upper bound for the optimal solution. And finally, that the spending restricted outcome reveals useful information for rounding, which is kind of more of an intuitive point that I just made before. What do you mean by the second point? That it implies a bound where which has low, which, it, which approximates it's opt in a better way, yeah. I mean, we can actually prove, we, we have an upper bound that we can prove a good approximation with, uh, whereas the previous one, there was no hope. Like, it's not even clear to me what the upper bound is. Yes. It, it, I'm going to describe okay, so it. Yeah, no. yeah, but no, since, no, no, since we can prove a, a constant factor, it's a good bound. No, no, I don't care about good. I just want to clear, understand what the bound is. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I'm, so that's <laughs> yeah, like it's a different uh, question. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, so first of all, when it comes to computing the spending uh, restricted outcome, the issue is that the spending constraint that I applied, I said there's the amount of spending that can go into any item is at most one. The spending is neither the primal nor the dual variable. It's a combination of the two. So in fact, where we used to have the sum of the xijs being equal to 1, everything is fully allocated, we're now replacing it with this. The sum of the xijs times pj is, a, is the minimum of 1 and pj. Right? So xij is a primal, pj is a dual. So the thing is that this constraint that we introduced, we didn't know how to write it as one convex program anymore. It was not clear that we can just introduce this constraint in here anymore. So in order to achieve this, we use those combinatorial algorithms that I mentioned before, where this constraint just fits in perfectly. And in fact, we get a strongly polynomial algorithm out of it, which is still of some value. No, sorry. What is j? j is for item. Yes, so for every item j, you know that the xij, so this is the amount of spending, the sum over all agents, Xij is how much the agent gets of that item. Pj is how much the price is. So Xij times Pj is how much the agent spent on that item. So if you sum over all agents, it's the total spending on that item. And you want this to be at most, to be the minimum of one in the price. Okay. So that's the first thing. I'm going to come back to this later on if we want to discuss this. But I guess the more interesting thing. So, you, so this it's not clear to me why this is a bound on the objective. Is it it's not a bound. It? It's not a bound. No, this is just a restating the. I'm just restating bound. what what we computed. What I'm saying the the outcome that we're trying to find can be described in this way. It's like the constraint we're introducing doesn't fit with the known program that we're using. The Eisenberg Yale program is all I'm saying. So it's not clear how to compute it. Uh, no, no, that's not what I'm asking. The, the, upper just... bound, the upper bound will not be using the objective of any program. Okay. Yes. So in order to get the upper bound, we'll be getting it in an indirect way using this solution. And this is the next slide. Mm -hmm. So if you look at this instance, uh, 
the first, yes, so the first thing I'm going to do, so I'm, this is proof by, the upper bond is proof by picture a bit, but uh, if, if you want, I can just take it slow and figure everything out if you're interested. But the, the question here is, we have this, uh, right, so, so I mentioned that the valuations, the scale of the values doesn't matter, right? So I can scale upwards or downwards however I want. So for convenience, in order to express our upper bound, I will scale everything so that every, every player's value for his, the item he's being allocated is equal to the price, right? Essentially, I'm multiplying by the inverse of this MBB, the maximum bond per buck ratio, your value divided by your price. I'm multiplying by this, and we get this. So the, essentially, you get 10, which is a, as much as you're spending. So you know that after doing this, your, either, your value for an item is either the price or less than that. It's the price if it's one of your favorite items. It's less than that if it's not one of your favorite items. So right now, after this multiplication, the scaling of the values, I know that everybody's value for an item is at most the price of the item. Okay? And I haven't changed anything. It's still well defined. And then the second thing we're doing is we're saying, here are the highly priced items, everything that has a price higher than one, and the low priced items the ones that have priced less than one. Roughly speaking, just to give you a sense of what we're doing, to get the upper bound, we're going to argue, to, to, to show, we're going to prove an upper bound for the case that H is integral, L is fractional. Right? We're going to assume these items are divisible, but H, the items in H, the important ones are indivisible, and we're going to prove an upper bound for that case. Okay? So partially relaxing the, the allocation space. And using this, we're showing, and this is the tricky part, this is why I, I scaled the, the values so that we can express the upper bound as a function of the prices. So what we're showing is that the spending restricted prices, P bar, the ones I just computed in the spending restricted outcome, and the scaled valuations VI, the ones I just described, having scaled in the way, uh, the product of the values in the optimal solution is at most the product of the prices in H. So in this case, it's at most 10 times 4 thirds. And I'm going to explain why this is the case. Roughly speaking, the reason why this is the case is the best thing you can do is allocate the important items, each one to a distinct agent. And then the best you can hope to do for the, uh, for the other items is give a value of one for everyone else. Everyone who doesn't get an item from H, the best you can hope to do is give him a value of one. In which case you get this product for the player, from the players that get an item in H, and ones from everyone else. So if H is empty, then you're saying this part is less than one? Is, yes. Is one. Because everybody, the best you could ever do is give everyone one. Because if you, if you can think of that, that's the easy case because then the sum of the prices is N. Right? Actually, this is actually a good point. This probably helps. If H is empty, then the sum of the prices is N, the total spending. Right? And it's also the, the social welfare, the total value you could ever get, the, the maximum value you could get is that, right? And what are you scaling again? So you that's the, I did not understand the scaling. scaling the prices. Can you go back? And yes. So we, so we scale the prices so that your value, essentially by the inverse of your MBB ratio. But of, scale the, what prices? the maximum bond per bike ratio. So you make sure the, the value of everyone is equal to the price of the item he's allocated. Can you just write it So you're scaling the values? Yes, oh, the values. Like, do you have a pen? Like, yes. So you have, uh, so VIJ prime is uh, equal to... Uh, VIJ divided by... Right, so VIJ divided by the, this ratio, uh, the max, max of over all J of uh, VJ, v, sorry, VIJ of over J prime, VIJ prime over PJ prime. Six, all multiplied by the inverse, right? So that means that all the items that satisfy this, that belong to that actually maximize my ratio, I'm going to have a value for them equal to the price. For everything else, I'm going to have a value less than the price. Okay. Yes. The only reason we're doing it, I mean, it sounds like a tricky thing, but the only reason I'm doing it is to be able to express the upper bound as a function of the prices. Because we don't know who will get what. All we know is that's the best you could ever hope for. And then what I'm saying is that Okay, so for the case that you, you mentioned, if the H is empty, the sum of the prices is N, right? 
It's the total spending, how much money everybody's spending. So everyone, the best you could ever do is give everyone a value of one. At most. Yes. So just to make it even simpler to prove that this is true, I will go back to the values and I'm going to increase all of them. Mm -hmm. so that everyone's value for every item is equal to the price, right? So I'm, if anything, I'm increasing the left-hand side. They're making it harder for me to prove it, right? So I'm increasing everyone's price so that they're identical. Everyone's value, sorry, so that they're identical. They all value every item equally. So that's a harder thing to prove. The thing is, and maybe that's, uh, that's easier to grasp, when the, every player is the same, maximizing the product is the same as maximizing the minimum. Okay, so we, in this instance I have now constructed, you just want to maximize the minimum. And back to the instance I was saying, if, if H is empty, the best you could get, the best minimum you could get is one. That's why this is easy. If H is not empty, the best you could get for these guys is one. And for the, the guys who get the top items, it's, you know, the, the value they get from that top item. Is that clear? So essentially it's a mixed thing. We're saying, all the items in H, we're going the best thing you could ever do because they already get a value higher than one, right? They are, Why is it the product of those things? Because they might... Well, it's the product of the values, the value of the agents that get something in H. So if an agent gets something from H, his value is equal to the price. Mm -hmm. And everyone, so essentially it's the values are the prices in H times one, 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 one for everyone who doesn't get an item. But I could give him multiple items, right? But that would make it worse. Why? Because these guys are already well off. The guys who get an, any, any agent who gets an item in H already has a value higher than one. So yeah. since you're trying to do max min, you shouldn't give him anything else. So, so exactly, this is a perfect question because the best thing you could do, so I just argue that here we want to do max min, right? So anyone who gets an item in H mm -hmm. gets, a value one, uh, gets a value higher than one. So he's fine. The, these guys are fine. And they're... At, so there are n minus h people who do not get that. And the sum of the prices, the last thing to observe is that the sum of the prices in L are also n minus h. Do you see that? Because the spending on the items in h is one for each item. So the spending here, which is equal to the sum of the prices, is exactly n minus h. So what I just argued is everyone who doesn't get an item in h there are more, at least n minus h such people, and they need to share this total value. So the best you could ever hope for is give them one each. Why, why, do you, why is it equivalent to maximizing the minimum? The maximizing the geometric mean? Yeah. If they're identical, I mean, it's, 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 it's true. Is it easy to speak? Uh, let me see. I don't know that I have a good argument for it, but. Wait, what? Why maximizing? Identical. Maximizing the product is. Yeah, because the sum is fixed. Yeah, so you have a set of values. The sum, the social welfare is fixed, mm -hmm. right? So you're maximizing the sum, the product of values. You're maximizing the minimum of values that sum up to the same thing. So the best thing you could do is make them. You're maximizing the product of values of a fixed sum. So the best you could do is balance them so they're equal. That's, that's, that's the argument. So if you have a fixed sum, essentially you're redistributing the same social welfare. So I've bounded the social welfare. I'm saying social welfare is the sum of you know, the values of, of these prices. And then the question is, how do I distribute it to make the product maximized? So the product is maximized when they're all equal. Um, yeah, so, so this comes from exactly this argument, that the players who do not get an item in H are at least N minus H. The sum of the prices here are exactly N minus H. So the best you could hope for for these people is that they get a value of one, even if these items were divisible, right? That's the best you could ever hope for. And that's where we use integrality, that the top items we cannot divide. So one player gets each. So that's where you get the product for the items in each of the, and that's the upper bound. So it's not, to answer your previous question, it doesn't come from the program directly. It's kind of a partial relaxation of the, using the solution. Then what did you use your program for, like the previous program? I mean, the program gives you PJ Bath. Oh, that's exactly. Nice. We get the solution. To, actually, we use it uh, in two ways. First, we use it to get the upper bound, and we use it for the solution, right? For the fractional solution. For the rounding. For the rounding.
I see. So you took the competitive equilibrium prices and you put it in the new co convex program and then you took the PJ no, no, no. PJ bar. So we didn't solve it using a convex program. We we introduced this constraint and defined a new notion of equilibrium, which we explain how to compute in a totally different way in a, using a combinatorial algorithm. I haven't discussed oh, I, this. I see your but once we compute this, we use the prices as a signal of how to de define an upper bound. And then we also use the, both the prices and the allocation for the rounding algorithm, which is the next slide. Okay, So this is the upper bound, this product of the prices. So roughly speaking, if I could design an algorithm that, of course, matches these expensive items to different people each, to distinct people, and then the other things rounds in a smooth way so the value is well distributed, then maybe I could hope to get a uh, good approximation. And this is more or less what the algorithm does. So one thing I didn't mention is that you can always make sure that this spending graph, this, these edges, they never, there's never a cycle in this, in this graph. That's easy by just redistributing. It's essentially you can redistribute the spending and make sure you're only spending on, uh, the, the, there's no cycle in this thing. It's not very important, but I'm going to be using the fact that uh, there's a that it, the, this is going to be a forest. The solution is going to be a forest, and the way we do it is the way we round is we take every tree in this forest, choose an arbitrary agent, and set it to be the root. And let's say this is agent A, and in this solution, in this fractional solution, he's spending money on some, getting fractions of some of the resources of the items, and these resources are also being competed for by other agents and so on. So you have this alternating sequence, and you get a tree like this one. And we're only going to be rounding using these edges. A player is only to, an agent is only likely to get an item if, there's, if he's spending something on that item in the fractional solution, in this fractional solution. So of course, the first step of, our rounding, of the spending restricted rounding algorithm is to compute the spending restricted outcome, which we can discuss later. But once you have this, you have these graphs, and the, what is the first easy step of the rounding? I just told you that I'm only going to round using these edges, the leaves, right? The item leaves, uh, there's no other option. So the first thing is allocate the leaf items upwards to, their, to the agents that, uh, that are the only ones spending on them. So that's easy, we do that. The second step is to allocate the low priced items. And here we've chosen by low price because that's, that was a convenient number for our rounding, the ones that have priced less than half. So any item that has le price less than half, we're also going to round it upwards to the parent agent. And that's where we use a tree. We try to make a consistent rounding, always upwards. And in this case, you look at all the prices. There's only one this year that has price less than a half. We take it and round it upwards, right? And then after we're done with this step, everything that remains, essentially we kind of got rid of the less important. Uh, agent resource. I didn't want to use I because I use it as an index for the, the but yeah. Okay. Agents and resources. Can you farm agents? Right now, yes. I mean, but I did it before, right? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. So it's the resources I allocated, the leaf, the leaf items, not the leaf agents. And then I allocate also the low priced items. So it's, it's, is it easy to see there's a forest? Or yes, because you, you don't care. Essentially, it's a tie-breaking issue, right? You have a, a set of MBB items. If you you can just redistribute, and it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. So, so now I've gotten rid of the less important things, and the, and I'm what's remaining is everything has a price less uh, at least half. So everyone who gets <clears throat> an item of the remaining ones actually gets half. You know, gets a half value, right? So that would be fine. So if, if, I could, if I could do a half value for everyone, that would be great. What we show is actually we cannot match everyone, but uh, we can match most of the people that are left. Uh, and in order to do this, what is interesting is in this last step, I'm going to do a matching. I'm matching the remaining agents to items. Each agent gets one of these items because they're the important ones. Nobody should be getting more than one of those. And you might ask, how do you do that? I mean, how do you match? There are many different ways to match. And the, the, the interesting thing is actually that last step, you can do it optimally. Because uh, you can just say vi of xp is the value of i based on what the first couple of steps, the value he already has. And then you can just change the vij to log of vi xp, the value he already has, plus vij, and do a maximum weight, uh, yeah, and add dummy items of value that much, so, and run a maximum weight matching algorithm. So the thing is, if you have unit demand, the problem is easy, right? It's a maximum weight matching algorithm. 
but the problem becomes harder when you want more than one items. But in this case, at this point, we only want to match people so we can do it optimally. And what we prove is essentially that everybody who gets an item in this phase is fine. So we would, if everybody got one, we would definitely get a two approximation because all the really important ones, the ones in H, go to a different player each and everybody else would get a value of half. We cannot do that. We cannot make sure everybody gets one of these items, but we're showing that in this matching, there exists a matching where even the ones who do not, the ones who do not get an item must have received substantial enough value from the first two steps. So they're, they're fine. And instead of a two approximation, uh, sorry, and this is the matching. Instead of two approximation, that's why we get a bit, although, although with a tighter analysis, we now believe we might have a two approximation here. So the second step, yeah. so the second step depended on your choice of A, but some of you are saying that doesn't matter. Yes. Yes. Actually, and and the leaf. Uh, actually, that's when. Uh, yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. The second, yeah, you're right. Yeah, it, it doesn't matter. It's arbitrary. So essentially, all we want is to make sure that at the end, really, you want, we end up having some components at the end. And we want to make sure that everyone, there always exists someone who receives value. If he doesn't get one of the items, he must have received value from his uh, children items. So no matter what the ordering, there exists such a person. Sorry. No, then, I mean, the mysterious step is like the second step, right? I don't see, like, if you cannot get matched in the third step, like, why would you say that he got a lot of small items? Is there a there always exists one within each component at the we end. We also have log VI of XP. No, but you're, you're talking about the proof, right? About how we can argue there exists someone. Because we always round upwards, and we're saying, essentially, it's because of, again, the scaling, that the sum of the prices is equal to the number of players, right? If all, all the items, if I... If I got all the items that I was spending on, then the prices of these items uh, would have been, so the sum of the prices are of the items that we were spending on are at least as much as the number of players in that component, right? So that's, that's the argument. If, if for some reason somebody doesn't get anything, that means that he must have been rounded something before. I mean, it's not, it's a delicate argument, but there always exists someone. That's the, the core of the, <clears throat> okay? And that's, yeah, so really, to, to summarize, I mean, the idea is that you get this market equilibrium. We, we apply this constraint. We compute this different market equilibrium, with, which reveals more information. And we use it in two ways. We use it in order to get this upper bound by treating the highly priced items as important and in, uh, indivisible, and then f allowing fractional relaxation on the less important items. And then the rounding goes along the same lines, that it tries to, to keep, it uses the prices again as a signal of keeping the, the highly priced items for the end, for the matching, and trying to be, unif trying to be balanced in the way to, uh, it uh, distributes the non-important items. Um, so the right answer should be two, right? So we haven't verified everything, but we think uh, with a tighter analysis, uh, the answer is two, yes. Uh, yeah, this was the first kind of rough uh, analysis that gave us this. Um, so let me wrap up with one quick, uh, uh, a quick discussion how we compute this. Uh, so because I think I actually like this, it's, it's based on Kiel's work and it's kind of how we, you can actually compute the market equilibrium in a combinatorial uh, way. And the nice thing is that if you're given a vector of prices P, uh, then you can write, you can have the following network here. You have a sink, here are all the agents, all the items, and a uh, source, uh, sorry, a, a source and a sink. And then the capacities of the edges from the source to the agents are one, equal to the budget. The capacities of the edges from the items to the sink are the prices, the current prices of the items. And then you have edges here if the item is one of the favorite items, the maximum bunk per buck items. And what is, uh, and yeah, this is what the second bullet says, that IJ between agent I and J exists if and only if item J is the maximum bunk per buck item for agent I at the current prices. And if you, could, if you compute a max flow in this uh, network, and it just so happens that uh, all these capacities are saturated, right? You're using all these capacities in full. What does it mean? That you're fine. Everybody's spending all of their budget on their favorite items, and all the items are fully allocated. So that would be fine. The tricky thing is, of course, how do you find the prices? And it's very delicate. Once you change the prices, you're really affecting this structure over here. You can change it dramatically, right? So if you change the, pr the prices, you change the structure. So 
how this works is you start from low prices, where essentially not all the, uh, the, the left, these edges over here are not used to capacity. Not everyone is spending the, and then you have over demanded items here. And then you gradually, in parallel, increase some of the prices. And the reason why you do it in parallel by the same multiplicative factor is to maintain these edges here. And you gradually increase this in a very careful way, and then you have to make sure this primal dual approach eventually completes in a polynomial number of steps. And this is uh, what Nikhil et al. showed in their, in their paper, how to actually do this in polynomial time, that there's a way of doing this in polynomial time. What, what is great about this uh, combinatorial algorithm is if you think about it, the flow is spending. What I just described, this maximum flow is essentially pushing spending through from the source to the sink. So all we need to do for our constraint, although it wasn't easy to introduce it into the convex program, is just okay, this, is, yeah, in, instead of having uh, the prices here, just have the minimum of the price in one. Right, so we just change this to capacity. So we introduce a new capacity constraint, which is at most one. So essentially, the same approach works by just introducing because they fit perfectly. These capacity constraints that we have on the spending, the spending is really the variable here in the flow. Uh, and this is, this is how we computed it. But as I mentioned before, uh, now there's also a convex program to compute this. So. I mean, <coughs> these things are some sort of monotonically increasing prices or something. Yeah, yeah. You have that to make sure. Yeah, you have to make sure. It's a, it's a delicate process. Otherwise, it, I don't see like how you can just put this thing. No, yeah. no, no, yeah. You have to, the parallel thing has to make sure that. Uh, you have to do it in parallel and make sure <clears throat> the events that take place, you know, because if you increase, maybe someone now is interested in something else. And <clears throat> this is your gradient design. This is a DPSP. That's it. Right. Thanks. <clears throat> Questions? Again, like, yeah, so I, I somehow. Um, so, of course, if the answer is zero, as you said, just a I can just calculate the mass, like a matching, right? Is there a matching? Uh, Let's say, I just want to check whether the answer is zero or not, and you value you zero maximum weight matching. So, uh, not just maximum weight, just matching, right? I just no, put the no. edge if, they, yeah. if the value is zero or non-zero, yeah. right? Jobs are, like, whatever, the agents on one side, items on the other. Yeah. And I, have a, I just look at this graph, I don't care about the value. To or check if it's zero or not, yeah, you can Yeah, so it. I just for every non-zero value pair. I but just it doesn't need to be zero, right? Huh? That, that's why I'm saying if you have one item, sure, it's going to be zero. That's why my example so has more items. It's not zero, it's low or high, right? If you have many items. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm just saying. Uh, if, if it is zero, it is zero if, if, if the host condition is violated. Right. right. Like, or like this yeah. matching, uh, but we know the matching polytope. So intuitively, you should, uh, the, the, the program should be stronger than that. You just don't want to just check matching. If there is one, you want to also have value on, on solutions, right? But uh, I'm saying the current solution cannot even detect zero versus not zero. Oh, the current, that, the that, but that you can do easily, right? That's a first. You can run this as a first step to verify if zero is yeah, the yeah, case. Yeah, yeah, but I don't want to do that, right? I, your program should do it, right? Your convex program should do it. I mean, which, the original version, the first convex. Whichever program. you write me a convex program. So how is your algorithm? How will your algorithm detect a zero solution? What step will it detect? Yeah, I guess. I mean, you can just. I don't know if it detects it uh, in it. It has to, right? It has to. If you want to give a. Yeah, no, I mean, you can run, that's what I said. I mean, we're assuming this is so, not, this is not an interesting case. I think if, the if zero is the best you could do, it's easy. No, so what, what will happen is in that case, sir, the outcome of his algorithm is also zero. will also be zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah but what will so, tell me? You so if the, the, the price is, is, is going to be a kind of infinite or something. Something like that. Yeah, that's fine. Whatever the price is, it is something. It will it be infinite? Yeah, the, the number, the prices are not unique for this new. Or that, zero, price will go to zero actually. By the way, that's that's actually interesting so for your. So that's all the prices. I mean, that's that's where PJ, Or other PJ, PJ will go to infinity. Yeah, good. PJs will go to infinity actually. Yeah. Price will yeah, go to infinity. And the PJ is in the solution, and that's where the whole set basically, yeah. You'll find the whole set, and yeah, the prices will go to infinity for that. Yeah. That's what basically the solution will be. And the prices, the prices are not unique that give you this. Uh, Spending I restricted think, equilibrium. I don't know if, if your program like, gives okay. particular prices, but you can multiply all the ones in each. You, know, you can increase them further. You can possibly increase them. It still doesn't change anything. You know, in, in some cases, for example, in this, this bidder who only likes that item, mm. you can 
So it's not really unique. Price so if you increase price the prices, price. we're not using the numbers of the prices, right? We're only using which ones are bigger than one and which are not. So otherwise, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Why is your problem? Like, it, I just still don't care. Kind of like, there's some. Your problem is somewhat two dimensions. In, like, can you formulate your problem in two? Like, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what. So the other thing is, do you prove it for a particular scaling of values? It, it, we're expressing the upper bound. No, we're not proving it for a particular scale. The scaling doesn't matter. We just the thing is, we we couldn't expre express the upper bound as a function of the player's value. We don't know what goes to whom, so we're expressing it as a function of the prices so the instead. Scaling doesn't matter for the allocation or the, the approximation scaling... or the approximation because we scaled both opt and it doesn't matter. It simplifies, right? Oh, it just it scales. Yeah, it doesn't okay. affect the approximation. It doesn't no, that's okay. Fine. okay, 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 okay. Okay. So yeah, the scaling is just a convenient way to express the upper bound in a succinct way. And um, another question: So, you, in your algorithm, did you show it only for this case where the budgets are one and this upper bounds are one? Yes, budgets are one. Different budgets. I'm not sure. This, this. Uh, I, we thought about it, but it's not it's clear how it generalizes. So sorry, what is it? Their algorithm equal budgets uh, yeah. works only when the budgets are equal, and this upper bound on the prices, all the budgets are one. For which algorithm? This one. To finding finding this SR outcome. Okay. All the budgets have to be one, and the upper bounds also. I'm not I'm, I'm not sure about the algorithm. I meant the rounding. I mean the ah, capacity so. whether, because the capacity constraint that we have is essentially a, bu a budget okay, okay, uh, worth. Budget. This is a question about just your algorithm itself. The comp you mean the computing the your the combinatorial algorithm. Is it, are you something it. about the upper bound also being? I mean, budgets may be different, but maybe the upper bounds you need them to be all. Uh, I don't um, think we use that. We don't. Yeah. I mean, we didn't look into that because even if we could compute that, it wasn't useful for the. It right, didn't right. seem to be useful for the rounding. But I don't think there was anything particularly specific to equal budgets. Okay. I mean, it seemed to be. Fitting nicely with uh, what already existed, it wasn't. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yeah.